Good to go. Okay, so um, we wanted, it, it actually works quite well that we've moved this into the front of the session because maybe some of the things that come up in this talk we can be thinking about when we come to the discussion parts. Um, but So we wanted to talk to you today about reporting to professionals and by professionals, I should say, and to the public and by the public, um, as I think they're, they're all connected. Um, the first bit which I'm going to talk to you about is reporting in context. So uh, I am going to focus a little bit on great literature, um, but it is also encompassing some other things. And uh, Tori is going to then do the second half of the talk, where she's going to talk a little more about communicating and engagement. So um, hopefully this will work. Um, if you've seen me present before in the last couple of years, you have probably seen this slide because this is my favorite slide in the whole world. It's beautiful. Um, so I really, really enjoy showing people this the first time when they haven't seen it before. So this was part of the English Landscapes and Identities Project. We collected, um, which is a big multi-period landscape project, big data project, with so many partners who have been fantastic sharing their data. Uh, we created this using the Excavation Index. As you can see, we're jumping forward in time. It's in the top right-hand corner. We're going by decade. Uh, and we're coming up to PPG 16 uh, in 1990. And you can see the massive impact that has and how much data we're creating. So uh, the Excavation Index shows is a, uh, held by Historic England. It's a data set that shows excavations that have happened in England. Uh, when we know where they are and what's happening with them. Uh, and the way we've done this spatially, um, I won't go too much into that, so you, if you want to be GIS geek with me later, we can talk about it, but basically we spatially bin this so that uh, the different colors show how many reports are within each of those spatial little areas, hexagon bins, um, across the UK, which I think for this are five kilometer bins. So that's within a little five kilometer area. And, oh, might be three kilometers actually. And um, the red obviously is uh, more than 250, uh, all the way up to more than a thousand, um, which clearly is London does, does quite a lot and within those decade time slices. So uh, we're creating a lot of data and that is definitely connected to the change in legislation from 1990 onwards. Um, so there's a clear link between commercial archaeology and producing archaeological knowledge in general in the UK. That's just a case the other one didn't work. So this is coming from, um, that's probably familiar to Doug actually, because this is coming from Lambert Research and their um, various publications they do on, on uh, which feed into CIFA reporting and things as well about who works in the UK, who are we, where are we from, how many of us are there. Uh, and you can see from this clearly 60% of people work in commercial development about archaeology. There is something, the numbers of this in total, uh, oh I did have my notes, but um, off the top of my head I believe it's 5,793 in 2016. I'm gonna... That's pretty close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like I'm close, I think I'm close. So. Um, the, and that's the 2016 numbers, so they're, they're changing all the time, obviously, but um, more than 60% of those people work in commercial archaeology. And if you also add on uh, people in local authority and national government as also having quite a big impact on commercial archaeology, part of the same system of working, although not everybody, obviously, you suddenly ramp up to you know 80% more or less of archaeologists working in the UK, employed in archaeology in the UK, are going to be involved in this development-led framework one way or another. And that feeds into what happens with grey literature reporting. So we have some here. This is taken from data from a variety of sources. Again, this is, I'm very grateful to the ADS and uh, pretty much every HR in England and um, the Archaeological Investigations Project which I should single out for how much data they shared that was useful for this. But from 1990 to 2010, so two decades, this isn't, so this isn't even up to date. This isn't coming up to the present day. 
um, we've got kind of approximations of how many of these different groups um, were producing data. This is just England. Um, and uh, they're not, they're very rough groupings of um, what kind of organizations are what. There's obviously overlap and mixing between people working with different hats on at different times. But the basic numbers are still pretty clear. You've got um, kind of more than 680 different individual commercial archaeological organizations working in the UK now. Uh, if we bring that up to 2017, I think um, you know, you're including units that have folded in the past and new ones that have been created, but you've got more than 700 and something. You know, we're, we're getting close to approaching a thousand different active players that have been around, and that includes one man bands and big, um, you know, several hundred strong big, big groups, um, big name groups. And between them, they've produced um, at least at the, the count when this went in was um, 15,000, more than 15,000 great literature reports exist. Uh, that's clearly no longer accurate because there's more all the time and the ADS is doing great work at digitizing their backlog of other things that have been produced. Uh, there's just a huge amount. We're, we're putting out so much uh, information out in the world and we're not really sure what we're doing with it. Where does it go? Um, so yeah, this is just um, repeating that again. So yeah, here we go. So we've got from 1990 to 2010, there's 779 organizations uh, from the Archaeological Market Survey. Uh, it was 5,736. Got the last, the last two numbers wrong. It was good. But um, this map just shows a little distribution from um, the AIP data set, um, which just shows the locations of where people have been doing work. And there's an interesting sort of trend showing up here, which is not surprising to, to make sense, but there's no one group that works everywhere in England. People definitely have territories, shall we say, where they tend to concentrate most of their um, production of work. Uh, and you can see interesting things coming out of this, like Oxford Archaeology had um, created their Oxford North office, and it clearly has generated work for them in the North, so there's, there's more um, signs of uh, different people working in different territories and areas. But there's uh, the other interesting thing to note about this slide is there's a clear concentration around London and the south, the south sort of central bands, the Thames Valley. Uh, and I think that comes into play when we start talking about standards and guidance and who does what, because I think what happens a lot is we end up talking to that cluster of people and we're missing out the work that happens elsewhere and the people that are working elsewhere. So I think it's really important to capture everybody. Um, again, this is, uh, an interesting question as well about how much does the actual archaeology change how we report things or what's going on. Uh, if you combine it with the slide before which showed that different units work in different areas, if you start thinking about what kind of archaeology is in different areas, you start getting kind of uh, units that um, are dealing more with one type of archaeology than other units. So their reporting looks different because they're reporting on, say, maybe an area where they do more geophysical surveys or where they do uh, a different kind of approach. We've noticed there's a real difference between when looking, you, mining through the excavation index data on the type of work people do in different areas. We've noticed that survey work of all kinds, walk over geophysics, um, with different kinds of geophysics, aerial surveys, far more popular in the north than they are in the south, although they're becoming more popular in the south, um, certain ones of them. In the south, the very south of London, southeast of it, not counting Devon and Cornwall, which are their own special world, um, we d there's a lot more trial trenching. If you start moving north, it turns into a lot more test pitting. 
And then if you start moving even further north, there's no evaluation. You have survey work to open area. And that's just a trend that's obviously not, um, but it's interesting that there's a clear difference in how we're working across the country as well. Um, so sorry, I should say that this map again is based on a mix of data. The green is showing you the excavation index, so where we know, or we think we know, work has happened. The Archaeological Investigations Project, which went out and visited individual units and collected um, their reporting and where they said that they had a report indicating work had happened. And then the Great Lit Library, um, which is showing where there's a report for that in the Great Lit Library. This looks quite scary for the Great Lit Library, but that's because this is now old data. And the Great Lit Library has, um, because they've been catching up on their backlog, there's a lot more red on the latest version of this if you have the complete data set. Um, but what's, what would be great is if every location had a dot in each color. That would show that we were doing things correctly. But as you can see, there are a lot of places with <laughs> dots and not all the same colors. So um, hopefully we're getting there. Things are definitely getting better and people are putting a lot of work in to make this kind of disparate system that feeds in in different ways work all together. Um, oh, is this not working? Okay, go to the next slide. It's because I had to click that over. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Panic. Um, so, um, I've just got one more slide to show you, and then I think Tori is up here. So this is just a brief recap. Um, this is some um, data that came out of my PhD research on where people were reporting and how. But, but the basic takeaway of this is what we've just gone over in the other two slides, that people are working differently in different areas of the UK, and then people, uh, companies are working in different territories in the UK. And what that means is we now have a regionalism of reporting. So our great literature is starting to be, you can characterize it as being different in different parts of England. So we're not unified entirely in what we're doing. And it would always be great to have things match up a little better. So yeah, so you've got this in-house styles, regional great literature, and we have to start thinking about what that means about synthesizing things. When we communicate archeology, span we tend to communicate the big story if we're doing public outreach, synthesis, putting stuff together, but if we can't synthesize things, it's really, really tricky. So the consequences of this is that I think, um, so this is some data from the, um, the um, economic impact workbook that um, from Historic England, um, they did one for social and one for economic. They're really great, they've got fact sheets, they update them all the time, I encourage you uh, to look it up and see that we do have an impact. Um, we do, uh, we're a big part of the GDP for, for what we do. Um, there's a lot of jobs. Um, the heritage workforce includes everybody, so not just talking about archaeology, now talking about people working with buildings and museums and uh, like lot more tourism things. It's a big group, there's a lot of people out there. We do have a big impact. We create a lot of work. There's a lot of money being spent we are asking developers to pay for us to produce this research. Um, and I feel like we do have an economic impact and perhaps we need to work on our social impact as a result of that. So our next part now is that uh, Tori is going to come up and talk to us a little more about engagement and communication. Okay, so I thought it'd be quite interesting to sort of, we've looked at the professional side of it and reporting, to look at communication, obviously the main aim, you know, we need to get information out there, how do we go about doing it? So I'd look a little bit about newspapers, so my PhD a few years ago now I was looking at newspaper coverage, how do newspapers report it, how do the public get their information, how do archaeologists feel about that coverage and sort of a bit in the middle. So that we start by looking, how do people get their information about archaeology? How does the general public, who doesn't necessarily have a particular interest, you know, they're not seeking out websites, they're not particularly looking for archaeology, where do they, if they do come across it, where do they find it? So if you look at this, 
this was a survey, I think it was about 200, 300 people who went to survey NAS and where they got their information. So newspapers are quite high up, TV documentaries are quite high up, then there's various other museums, internet, TV dramas, novels. And particularly if you look at local, you know, local archaeology stories, local, what's happening in the local area, newspapers were quite important, followed by museums. And obviously with this coverage comes a bit of concern because you, you haven't got full control over what's getting out there. And so I, I talked to archaeologists and said, you know, what are your concerns about newspaper coverage? This was specifically looking at newspaper coverage of human remains, which obviously is quite an emotive topic. I mean, most bits of archaeology can be controversial, but I think people have quite strong feelings obviously, about human remains. So people had concerns that they re the newspaper articles rarely state what will happen to the human remains. Some reporters are spectacularly resistant to being corrected or educated. There's little to no information provided about why excavations are taking part. And people are concerned that misinforming the public either through poor facts or inference does not aid researchers in doing their work. So I think there were sort of three key things that came out of that. You know, they were concerned. So I'll go into this. So obviously if you've got bad press, people are concerned about what's happening. They were concerned about the implications. So if people receive bad press in the light of current economic insecurity, this could prove detrimental. Over-exaggerating the wrong aspects can lead to ethical questions or issues. And then somebody commented that sensation is one lurking hint of desecration. <coughs> and so I thought this is quite interesting. You know, people are concerned about newspaper coverage, but it's quite anecdotal. Or you don't, you know, do we remember the outrages and mistakes rather than the smooth successes? So you can kind of compare what people are concerned about against what the newspapers actually reported. So obviously before there was a concern about, there was a lack of effort to accurately present why studies are carried out, why you're excavating human remains. And if you go to the newspapers, you can see that actually in quite a lot of newspaper articles, it is covered to people. They are including why it's being excavated. Another concern was that they wanted the process of excavating human remains needs to be reiterated throughout the article. You know, it's not that you've just gone out point them out. It's actually a process to it. And yes, I think people's concerns are maybe a bit more valid here. It was excluded in quite a lot of articles. And then there was a concern that the newspaper articles rarely state what will happen to the human remains. They're not saying whether they're going to be reburied or kept. They're not saying what's going to happen. And again, I think this is correct. Newspaper articles tended not to mention that. But I think it's important to sort of look at news and what is news. Um, obviously newspaper article, I was looking mainly at print newspaper articles and I'll come on to online news, you know, things are changing quite rapidly into online news, but the average newspaper article is 350 words, traditionally a newspaper article about archaeology, human remains, was in the middle of the newspaper, so pages sort of 16 to 20, and it was written by a non-specialist. So I think it's quite useful, interesting to look at news from a news perspective, so what is news? the events happening, occurrences which impress journalists with their, and their audiences with their importance or interest, their remarkableness, their noteworthiness. But at the same time, it's important to remember news, neither news nor language, are a transparent window on the world. Journalists reshape real life, they cut away details to create a narrative that works. They're there to sell their newspapers and their stories, not necessarily to sell archaeology. So this is a list of news values. So there was a study done, they were media, media researchers in 1965, but it's still quite used quite a lot. It's quite common to look at why are certain things in the news and certain things not in the news. And they came up with this list of 12 things. So frequency, so if something happens more rarely, it's more important to the news. They go, oh, this is quite exciting and interesting. Negativity, newspapers like negative things. Unexpectedness, unambiguity. And I think these two a bit further down are quite important to archaeology in particular. Reference to elite nations and elite persons. So I think a while ago, you know, you tend to get stories about, there's one about Robert the Bruce, Celtic warriors, the Roman uptown girl, aristocratic warriors. So it's, yes, it might frustrate archaeologists, I think, that this goes in, but this happens across the whole range of views. And so on top of what gets chosen to be news, there's also the way that you frame news. So news, like I said, news isn't a transparent window on the world. It's a social construct. 
you know, can try to be objective, but there can be 101 different ways of reporting the same story. And newspapers choose the way that they frame their story, the way that they, they put those elements together. And so framing is another way of looking at what gets reported and how it gets reported. So it's a central organising idea or storyline that provides meaning to an unfolding strip of events. Frames are largely unspoken and unacknowledged, organising the world for both the journalists and you know, to those of us who rely on their reports. So I think when thinking about sort of reading newspaper articles or if you're producing your own, so it's, I think it's quite useful to think about it from the media perspective, going actually what do they want from us, not just what do we want to get in. Again, I look briefly at framing what sort of things get, how do things get reported in the newspaper about human remains. So the process is quite, came up quite often, but they quite like the idea of revealing secrets and the value of things, you know, going back to those elite places, elite persons. Is it briefly, you know, we're looking at reporting the same thing, reporting archaeology from different perspectives. So science, archaeology, like it might take years, it's written by a specialist, focusing on results and methods, wary of absolutes sometimes, the topic's important, and report focuses on the details and then you get an overview. Whereas to a journalist, they've got very, very short time in which to produce something. They're a generalist, they want something that's relevant to everyday life because it's much easier to write something in 350 words if it's easy to explain. You don't have to spend your first 300 words going explaining it all in more detail. Obviously, the text is important. They don't like uncertainty. So we go, well, it might be this, but it might not be. No, journalists like, no, we need a definite, definite answer. So I think so I've got, gone through those bits. I think they're useful to bear in that mind. Obviously, the world is changing quite rapidly with online news. So I think some of the things are still, are, are still quite relevant, but with online news, there's an infinite space. So there's potentially potential for loads and loads and loads of news articles. But obviously, there's still the time pressure. Journalists still have to churn out all these articles. Selective reading. Traditionally, you'd read from the front of a newspaper to the back of a newspaper, and you'd be able to pick up your archaeology story somewhere in there. Now, you can select whatever. If you're not interested in it, you can just click through that. I think I very rarely read the economic section of an online newspaper. It just, it's just on my radar. So I think maybe you need to, the headline needs to grab people a bit more. But then at the same time, a newspaper, an online newspaper article is less isolated from the rest of the world than a print newspaper article was. So you can have now up here you can share this story, you can see more on this story, you can see related internet links. Obviously you can have your say, communicate with others. The last point, it stays around. So in the past, your newspaper article, you know, today's newspaper article is tomorrow's fish and chip wrapper. Online it stays around a lot longer. I think that was, that was about it. Thank you so much.